As we approach the 2024 college football season, the Alabama Crimson Tide are under a new head coach in Kalen DeBoer, and things look a little different than when Nick Saban was the head man. I don't really know what is going to happen or what the future looks like for the Tide, but I thought of an interesting topic. What was Alabama football like 10 years ago? That's what we're going to talk about in today's video. We're going to go back in time and talk about what was going on in Tuscaloosa then, go through the 2014 season, the preseason expectations, and what Alabama football was like just a decade ago. But before we get started, if you're a big fan of college football, be sure to subscribe to the channel, leave a like if you want to support today's video, and let me know what player, team, topic, or situation I can cover next. Now let's get started and talk about what Alabama football was like 10 years ago. So yeah, 10 years ago was August 12th of 2014, but in order to understand where the Crimson Tide were in 2014, I feel like we need to go back a year. So in 2013, the Tide had a ridiculous amount of hype as they returned their star quarterback AJ McCarron, and they also had a superstar running back in TJ Yeldon, and a young Amari Cooper who was becoming one of the better receivers in the SEC. They are loaded on defense as usual, as they had guys like CJ Mosley, HaHa Clinton Dix, and Landon Collins. Things were going really well for the Tide, and many expected them to win a national championship, and they were off to a tremendous start. They ended up beating Virginia Tech in the Chick-fil-A kickoff game, went on the road and beat Johnny Manziel's Texas A&M Aggies, and then took care of Colorado State in Week 3. After that, they would blank number 21 Ole Miss 25-0, and then would dominate in their next seven games, beating Georgia State, Kentucky, Arkansas, Tennessee, number 10 LSU, Mississippi State, and Chattanooga. The Tide were ranked number one in the country and were 11-0 for their final matchup with number four Auburn. Auburn was coming off of an incredible game in which they beat Georgia by way of a crazy tip pass, and they were the story of the year. Gus Malzana had a terrible first year, but Auburn was back and in national championship contention in just one season. They'd match up for one of the biggest Iron Bowls in history, and Bama was leading with just a couple seconds to go. Unfortunately for Tide fans, Nick Marshall ended up finding Sammy Coates for a crazy touchdown, but Bama was going to get the last laugh. They had started driving down the field, and TJ Yeldon found a way to get out of bounds to set up a long field goal. After a long review, and to the dismay of Auburn fans, Yeldon was told that he got out of bounds with one second left, and Bama was going to kick a miracle field goal and end up going to the SEC Championship game. Unfortunately for Bama fans, and to the luck of Auburn fans, one of the greatest plays in the history of the sport happened. Chris Davis ended up returning the missed field goal 99 yards for a touchdown, as Bama didn't really have any athletes on the field, and Auburn had a great blocking scheme, and honestly just had the luck of Jordan Hare on their side. They ended up returning the kick and having one of the greatest moments in college football history, and then they would go to the SEC Championship and beat Mizzou, before they would lose to Florida State in the national title game. For Bama fans though, this was awful. Not only did they miss out on both the SEC and national championship, but they lost to their rival in literally the most ridiculous way possible. Instead of coming out firing in their bowl game against number 11 Oklahoma, they ended up getting beaten pretty badly for Saban standards. They would lose to the Sooners 45-31, and an 11-0 season turned into an 11-2 season, which was extremely disappointing. Many thought the Tide would win three straight national championships, but instead, they had an extremely disappointing ending to the season. Technically, Alabama was dominant, but they did regress a little bit, as Saban was outcoached by both Gus Malzahn and Bob Stoops. This was disappointing, but going into 2014, expectations were high that Saban would right the ship and get them right back to where they were. One article said, quote, For all the talk of Alabama's weaknesses and Nick Saban's struggles against the hurry-up, it'll take a miracle to keep the Tide out of the SEC championship, and it might take a similar level of misfortune to keep them out of the playoff. Yeah, college football was now headed in a new direction, as they had a four-team playoff instead of the BCS National Championship, so it was going to be even harder to keep the Tide out of the postseason. This is now where we get to where Bama football was 10 years ago. Usually in the second week of August, there's a ton of previews and a ton of talking points, and at the time, Bama was being talked about a ton. A head coach, they returned Nick Saban, obviously, and then they also brought a new offensive coordinator, Lane Kiffin, who was a huge name at the time. At defensive coordinator, they returned the season Kirby Smart. On the offensive line, they had Mario Cristobal. At wide receivers coach, they had Billy Napier. And then for linebackers and associate head coach, they had Kevin Steele. That's one of the most loaded coaching rooms I've ever seen in my life. And combine that with all the talent they had, Bama was going to be great. At quarterback, they had just lost one of the best players in school history in A.J. McCarron, so now both Jake Coker and Blake Sims were going to have to battle it out for the job. Going back in time with him, he was a borderline four-star quarterback coming from St. Paul's School in Mobile, Alabama, and after originally going to Florida State, he'd become the backup to E.J. Manuel in 2012, and then ended up losing the job to Jameis Winston in 2013. He would then transfer to Bama for the 2014 season, but he would have to compete against Blake Sims. He was a huge quarterback from Gainesville High School in Georgia, where he was both a star with his arm and with his legs. 
He ended up becoming a four-star recruit and chose to go to Bama over Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida State. And after spending 2010 to 2013 as a backup, he would finally win the starting job as a senior over Coker and actually had a really good season. In terms of the running back room, they were loaded. They returned their former five-star Derrick Henry, had TJ Yeldon back for one more year, plus had plus had a couple of really highly recruited running backs such as Alt Tenpenny, Tyron Jones, and a young Kenyon Drake. The offense was completely loaded, and to many, they had the most deep running back room in the country and an extremely talented receiver room. They had five-star tight end OJ Howard, Amari Cooper, Christian Jones, Chris Black, DeAndrew White. They also had a couple of other highly recruited guys such as Robert Foster and Jalston Fowler. On the offensive line, you had huge names like Cam Robinson and Ryan Kelly, and the defense was also looking to be much improved in the pass rushing department. While Tim Williams was suspended for a little while, he was going to be back, and many thought this was the deepest line that Saban had ever had. You also had players such as Jonathan Allen, Ashawn Robinson, and Dalvin Tomlinson, and then at linebacker, you had Xavier Dickinson, Trey DePriest, Reggie Raglan, and Reuben Foster. In terms of the secondary, Cyrus Jones had emerged in 2013, and they also returned Landon Collins and Nick Perry, and had two highly regarded freshmen in both Tony Brown and Marlon Humphrey. You also had Eddie Jackson, who was nursing an injury, but he was going to be the best corner on the team. There were obviously plenty of other notable players on the roster, but you also had J.K. Scott, who was one of the most iconic special teams players from the 2010s. Now with a loaded roster and a lot of fuel from last season, how would they end up doing in 2014? Well, they would end up starting number two in the country, and they actually had a really interesting game in week one against West Virginia. This was the Chick-fil-A kickoff game, and this is where we saw the emergence of Kevin White. Kevin White absolutely torched the Alabama secondary and had an insane game for a receiver, but ultimately Bama pulled away and won 33-23. After that, they'd come home and play against Florida Atlantic, in which they would blank 41-0, and then they would beat Southern Miss 52-12. It was so far so good for the Crimson Tide, and after that, they'd come home and play against Florida. This was supposed to be a huge matchup, as the Gators started out number 10 in the country and were led by their former big-time recruit Jeff Driscoll at quarterback, and then a two-headed monster at running back in Kelvin. Taylor and Matt Jones. Unfortunately, after an early loss to Miami, Florida would fall off a little bit. The Gators ended up starting out unranked, and despite beating Eastern Michigan and Kentucky in triple overtime, they would not be ranked for their road matchup with number three Bama. The tide ended up being way too much for them, as Florida would get killed 42 to 21, and Bama was now 4-0 in the month of September, and they were on their quest to get another national championship. After that, the Crimson Tide would go on the road to play against number 11 Ole Miss. With the hiring of Hugh Freeze from Arkansas State, the Rebels had seen a meteoric rise under Freeze. While the game was not competitive at all in 2013, the Rebels were now off to a hot start in 2014. They were led by a ton of big-time players, such as their star quarterback Bo Wallace, superstar tight end Evan Ingram, and then guys like Laquan Treadwell and Robert Nikimdenshi. Ole Miss was as talented as they had ever been, and after starting out ranked number 18 in the country, they would cruise to a 4-0 record and would be ranked number 11 for their college game day matchup with the Crimson Tide. This game ended up being insane, as it was one of the best games from the 2014 season, and after a late touchdown, Bama was now down 6, and Blake Sims was tasked leading them to a victory. After leading them down the field, Sims would throw an end zone pass, and it was eventually intercepted. At least, that's what replay said. At first, you couldn't tell if he got his foot down, but after going to the monitor, the Rebels in fact intercepted the pass and won the game and stormed the field. This was the greatest moment of the Hugh Freeze era at Ole Miss, and Bama had fallen. Tide fans were not happy with this, but luckily for them, they would get it together. The following week, they would then get a chance to play against Arkansas on the road, and the Razorbacks were starting to surge under former Wisconsin coach Brett Bielema, who was starting to build them up. The Razorbacks ended up going under the radar and actually got out to a 13-7 lead. In the fourth quarter, Blake Sims would find DeAndrew White for a touchdown, and that would end up being the game winner. Bama survived 14-13 and won by one point. After this two-game stretch, Tide fans were not happy. They lost to Ole Miss and almost lost on the road to Arkansas. This was seen as unacceptable. From there, they'd come back home and play against Texas A&M, who after a hot start with Kenny Trill, ended up falling off, and Bama won 59-0. They were back to their old Bama ways, and from there, the tie would start to cruise once again. they go on the road to play against Tennessee, and while the Butch Jones era was starting to get better, Bama would win that game by two touchdowns. From there, they'd then play against number 14 LSU, and this was an awesome game. The Tigers were led by Anthony Jennings at quarterback, but they had their own phenom running back in Leonard Fournette, and this game would go down to the wire. LSU would drill a field goal to go up 13-10, which is 50 seconds to play, and then Adam Griffith would hit a field goal with no time left to send the game to overtime. 
LSU was not able to execute no T, and DeAndre White would catch a game-winning touchdown pass, and they would beat the number 16 Tigers 20 to 13. Things would not get any easier for the Tide, as they now would have to face the Cinderella team of the 2014 season, Mississippi State. Under head coach Dan Mullen, the Mississippi State Bulldogs came out of nowhere. They were 9-0 for their matchup with Bama and were led by their superstar Heisman-level quarterback Dak Prescott. They also had Deronya Wilson and Josh Robinson at running back, plus eventual superstar Chris Jones. This game really wouldn't go down to the wire, as Bama went up 25-13 with 8 minutes to go, and despite a garbage time touchdown, the Dogs would lose 20-25 and Bama cruised. They are now back in the driver's seat to win the SEC West, and after a dominating victory over Western Carolina, they would now play against number 15 Auburn. After last year's kick six, Bama was not happy and they were ready to get revenge. Auburn was in a good spot. Nick Marshall was back for his senior year, Cam Artis Payne and Corey Grant became the two main running backs, and then you had both Sammy Coates and Duke Williams at the receiver spot. They ended up having a huge game, as while well, Auburn would put up 44 points in Bryant-Denny Stadium, Alabama did better. Blake Sims ended up throwing for four touchdowns and over 300 yards, Yeldon went for over 100 yards and two scores on the ground, and Amari Cooper had 224 yards receiving with three scores there. They ended up winning 55-44, and Bama would return to the SEC Championship after a one-year break. While they were there, they would play the Missouri Tigers. Mizzou was not expected to do a whole lot in the SEC, but after a breakout 2013 season, many expected them to go back to being near the bottom. No one really expected them to be good in 2014. Led by Maddie Mock, Mizzou would will themselves to the SEC Championship, and even though Shane Ray got ejected from the game, it didn't matter, as Bama would cruise to a 42-13 win. They would now get a chance to play in the inaugural college football playoff, where they'd be matched up with Ohio State. Ohio State had now gone through three quarterbacks in one month, and led by Ezekiel Elliott, they were surging. Against the number four Buckeyes, this game would go back and forth. Ohio State would score a touchdown at the end of the first half to make it a 21-20 game, and then from there, Ohio State would have a long bomb touchdown and then a 41-yard pick six, and they would go up 34-21. The Tide were completely punched in the mouth, but Blake Sims would then have a five-yard touchdown run. They were back in business, and if they could just get one stop, they'd get an opportunity to get the ball back and potentially take the lead for good. Unfortunately, from there, the most iconic moment from that game would happen as Ezekiel Elliott would run to the left and then go 85 yards for a touchdown. They'd also complete a two-point conversion, and Ohio State would go up 42-28. to While Amari Cooper did have a late touchdown, Ohio State would end up winning and eventually went on to win the national championship, and Bama would go home early. This was super unfortunate for Crimson Tide fans, as now two straight years they would not have a national championship. While they did end up getting to the national title game, it was still seen as a disappointment. Still though, the team was good. Blake Sims led the way with 3,487 yards and 28 touchdowns. Derrick Henry and TJ Yeldon both had nearly 1,000 yards and had 11 touchdowns apiece. Amari Cooper had 124 catches for 1,700 yards and 16 touchdowns. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Landon Collins led the way with 98 tackles. Xavier Dick Dickinson led the way with nine sacks, and Landon Collins and Cyrus Jones both had three interceptions apiece. What would eventually happen to those tied players? Well, Amari Cooper would go number four overall to the Oakland Raiders, safety Landon Collins went in the second round to the New York Giants, and then TJ Yeldon ended up going to Jacksonville in the second round. Tide would end up having four more players drafted, as their fullback Jalston Fowler went to the Titans, Ari Quanjo ended up going to the Redskins, Austin Shepard went to the Vikings, and Xavier Dickinson went to the Patriots. Honestly, it wasn't the best draft class in Alabama history, but it wasn't the worst either. Honestly, in retrospect, it was a weird year for the Tide. They had a one-year quarterback in Blake Sims, they had that crazy upset to Ole Miss, and they faced the hottest team in the country in Ohio State. For the most part, it was a successful year for the Tide, but for Nick Saban's standards, it was another failure. From there, though, he'd end up dominating even more throughout the 2010s, and would get a couple more national championships and send a ton of players off to the NFL. That's what Alabama was like 10 years ago. It's crazy how much can change in a decade, and it feels like just yesterday Blake Sims was the quarterback. What do you think of Alabama 10 years ago? What team should I do for this next? And what other topics should I cover on the channel? Be sure to let me know down below. Leave a like if you want to support today's video. Subscribe if you're new. And check out all my other videos on the end screen. Hope to see you guys again soon. But until next time, peace.